During the series this year, we've looked at a lot of topics from history to locomotives, to signaling, to coaches, to diesels, to horticulture. But there's one topic which we have yet to cover. The most important part and something on the railway that doesn't move, but literally keeps that railway rolling. You can have a railway without signals. You can have a railway without locomotives, coaches, wagons. You can have a railway without stations if you're really keen. But what's a railway without track? So in today's episode, we're going to look at the permanent way. Lots of all good things on the railway. Everything exciting happens before the sun rises. Let's go and meet Peeway. Today I'm joining Brian and Adrian on one of their weekly track walks along the line. Brian has been with the railway for six years and will be carrying out the inspection. Adrian joined the railway in 1985 during the last few months of the rebuilding of the line to Alton. Today, he's acting as our lookout, but we'll talk about that later. So Brian, what is P-Way about? What are their responsibilities? Well, in essence, P-Way looks after the railway's infrastructure. The track, the fencing, the embankments, the vegetation, points, anything that the trains run on, basically, and people stand on. This is kind of the most crucial part of the railway, because you can technically have a railway without locomotives, but you can't have a railway without the railway itself, can you? Well, we like to think we're a bit special, yes. Oh, definitely. So what are we doing today? We're carrying out the weekly track inspection. We're looking for keys that work loose and sometimes pop out. Looking for obstructions on the line. Some obstructions over there, in fact. Oh, yes, yes. Um a local wildlife I have heard is uh, yeah. we're famous for it. We're looking for landslips, we're looking for anything that shouldn't be there, like sheep or deer. So do you tend to get a, a lot of animals on the line? Oh. Yes, indeed we do. We have several deer. I've been with the department for six years now and we get deer quite frequently. We find foxes. Somebody found a badger once. Sometimes there are buzzards and kites sitting on the rail. The wildlife is actually quite spectacular. I have to admit, the scenery is wonderful out here. I can imagine it's terrific on a nasty day, but uh, on a nice hot summer's day, it's, it's a dream job, isn't it? Well, it's one of the reasons that I like doing this, apart from an interest in the railway anyway. You can walk along like this on a Saturday morning, as, as you say, in the summertime, and it's, it's wonderful. And you do get to see the seasons. Throughout the year, you see, starting in the spring, you know, the, the uh, fields being seeded and then all growing and, until harvest at the end. And it's a really nice experience to see life going by like that. It's not something that you get if you're sitting at home all day and have a weekend. As we continued our journey across the high embankment, Brian noticed that something wasn't quite right with the track. Okay, well, here's the key out again. So what are the keys? The little bits of metal that fit in between the side of the chairs and the rail, and they actually hold the rail in place and stop it flexing sideways. Also, I suppose if too many go out, the train just kind of goes badum into the track. Well, in theory, it would. In practice, we've never yet had one, and we don't ever want. To have start saying we never have one. <laughs> no. So we have to knock him back in again, fairly smartly. Here we go. And with the fault rectified, it was time to continue onwards down the line towards Ropley, where I took the opportunity to ask Brian a few more questions. Brian, what kind of faults do you find when you're doing track walks? Ideally, is none, but realistically, <laughs> what, it, what kind of faults can none. you find? What we find mostly is broken chairs, 
and cracked fish plates. They're both fairly uh, important things to put right. The fish plates we have to put right immediately, which is why we do the inspections early morning, because we want to put anything like that in order before the trains start. Makes sense, yeah. We do find sometimes at these joints that they crack right the way down. So we have to get replacement plates, which we keep in stock, and fit them almost immediately. The chairs we find sometimes crack across and they're put down for scheduled maintenance because we can live with a broken chair here and there. We also have a look at the sleepers. Because the sleepers are quite elderly, concrete sleepers sometimes crack. So we keep an eye on those. And if we do find a cracked sleeper, we'll mark it up and replace it. We've quite a programme of replacing sleepers. We sort of try to do a number a year. Preventive maintenance almost. If we spot a problem at all, it goes down on the list and we then make sure that we get around to it. So how hard is it to replace a sleeper? Is it a lot of man and machinery or is it kind of two people and a couple of shovels? There's no machinery, there's a lot of manpower. Ooh because digging out the ballast is very hard. It's quite compacted, having been down for years, but it's amazing what some men with a shovel can do. Yes, because I've seen on the National Network, they have um, tampers and stone blowers and lots of fancy machines that are doing kind of 100 miles of, at yes, a time. Well, yes, maybe that, not that, that, that much, would but... be nice, but we're, <laughs> we're with the traditional heritage railway way of doing things. Excellent, manpower now. Which is manpower, yeah. <laughs> And a exactly. lot of Weetabix in the morning. Exactly <laughs> so, yeah. To get the sleepers out is quite a job because it takes at least six people to move a sleeper. You've probably seen people doing this sort of thing with what appear to be upside down scissors, which wrap, you dig out the sleeper, wrap these dogs, sleeper dogs they're called, around, and you need at least three pairs of uh, people to lift and drag the sleeper out and then reverse the process, lift and drag the sleeper back in again. Then you repack underneath, put the ballast back, give it a, as hard a thumping as you can because when the next train comes over it, that will consolidate things for you. As we continued down the hill, I had a chance to reflect on just how different the railway looked from the ground. Strangely, Bridges seemed to feel a lot higher when you were standing on the track looking down. But as we neared the station, Brian took the opportunity to show me just why sleepers occasionally need replacing. Well, here's a sleeper that we found on a previous inspection. As you can see, it's suffering oh, yes. a little bit. Wires and everything. The um, reinforcement wires have started to show through and we've been back, dug it out, ready for changing which we'll do during the close season obviously when there are no trains running because we can't do this sort of thing when there's trains running. No, oh, understandably so. So if you come down and find a, a sleeper with fault like this obviously it's not going to be pre-dugged out. But no, no, we, we <laughs> have to dig it out. So what do you do? Is this a job stopper? Is this a fix it quickly or? Oh no, it's uh, next schedule maintenance. Although it looks fairly horrendous, it's actually still safe. The trains can run over it with no problem. But we don't like these sort of things around, so we put them, we put them right. Wonderful stuff, I suppose. That's the advantage of going out yeah. early at a crack of sparrow. Yeah, yeah, we do it before the trains actually start their service, so that anything that is uh, going to pose a serious problem to the trains, we find it straight away. That is fair enough. Well, wonderful. Since this has been reported and dealt with, shall we crack on? Yeah, surely. While Brian was the one undertaking the track inspection, he hasn't been alone on the walk. It was time to talk about Adrian, who, so far, has not spoken a single word. And here's why. So while we've been doing this, obviously I've just been talking to you, we've also had Adrian with us. Ah. who we're, told we're not allowed to talk to because he's looking out. No, so, Adrian, we can't talk to Adrian, we can't distract him in any way 
and he can't take part in anything that the patrolmen do. He has to stay completely independent, keeping his eyes and ears open. So the lookout's job is literally is look for a train and tell the track staff when it's coming. I've seen them use kind of horns and flags and that sort of thing. That's correct, yep. You see he's got a lookout badge on that identifies him as lookout to the train crew. What kind of people do you get at Peeway? Do you have to be kind of qualified to do it or can sort of no, anyone no, join no. in? No, no, We come from a huge range of backgrounds. We've got watchmakers, electronics professors, architects, pipeline engineers, all sorts of people. And the good thing about it is that within that group of people, there's somebody who likes doing every job on the Peeway. You get people, patrolmen, they like to do the walk. You get people who like to keep the embankments clear and in order and you get people who just love messing around on the track itself. So what's happening at Alton at the moment? Well up towards the Alton end we've replaced eight double lengths of life expired rail. It's been down there since the railway was extended to Alton, come to the end of its life and it's time to replace it so we're calling Peeway Gang to do that. Oh fantastic so is there a set standard for how long rails last or is it an individual case, does it vary? Much depends on this particular line with its gradients and its big engines, it won't last as long as other heritage railways. But the track, the rail itself, is inspected, ultrasonically tested, and gauged quite periodically. Oh, fantastic stuff. It, it's amazing to think just how much work goes into, I wouldn't say static, but a non-moving component. Well, hopefully it doesn't move. Well, we don't Except want for points, to, obviously. We don't want it to move anywhere. No, no. I know it's just amazing to think about how much goes into it and how much the customers... You, you know a bad ride when you feel it, but you never really appreciate what a smooth ride feels like until you really... Well, until you experience a bad one, I suppose. But. Well, I believe that since we've replaced those rails up at the Alton end, the crews have been saying it's much smoother in that area. Fantastic news, yes. The locomotives really can rattle around quite a lot, especially when they're working hard yes. going up the hill. As we passed through Ropley, Brian did a touch of point oiling to ensure that everything operated smoothly. Leaving the station behind, the sun finally emerged, and we carried on our journey towards Allsford, still under Adrian's watchful eye. But just around the corner, we came across a feature which you may have noticed before. So Brian, we've seen a, a lot of these huts dotted around the railway. What are they? They are in fact permanent way huts and they were originally built about every half mile apart for the permanent way gang to use as a base for their tools, to have a cup of tea in and most importantly I think to get in out of the winter chill because you can have a fire in there. They were replaced some years ago. We've built five of them within the Mid Hans permanent way gang. They were designed by Adrian, our Saturday gang leader, and they've been built over a period, and this one actually is quite special because we use this one for our midsummer barbecue. On, a, on an evening when the dining train is running, we set out a table, chairs, silver service, we all wear high vis, and we sit there with our barbecue and wait for the dining train to come by. And they all crowd over one side looking at us and we're cheering them. Of course, we're only drinking water because we're on railway. Yes, now. yeah. <laughs> that sounds that. brilliant, it's not a little eccentric. And that is one of the things that sort of persuaded me to join the permanent way department. That little idiosyncrasy. And there you are, guys, the most important part of the railway by no doubt, and something that we potentially all take for granted, but really, what is a railway without rails? Brian, mate, thank you so much for taking me along today. It's been really interesting and surprisingly complex about how much work there is to do with Fernand Way. Well, thank you very much for coming along. You're welcome. Thank you, and also thank you to Adrian, our lookout, who obviously can't respond because he's doing his jobs. And folks, thank you for watching, and we shall see you next week for our last episode of Things You Now Know. Let's have a cup of tea. Thank you, yes.